My dear Mr. Shepard, I live in Staten Island, and I have been listening to W.O.I. for years. In fact, one could say that I am a W.O.I. lover. I raise my children to the sound of John Gambling Sr., Today I listen every day to John Gambling Jr. But every time your rotten theme comes on, my hackles rise and rise. My husband Charles is writing a letter to the FCC. We feel nice, quiet people who like nice. Now the, now the Sheikh of Araby. Oh, madam, your love belongs to me. Oh, at night, baby, when you're asleep. <laughs> Into your tent I'll creep Rasmus the stars that shine above Will light our way to love You will rule this land with me I'm the sheik of Araby I'm the sheik of Araby Call it there I just want to let you know that my heart's in the right place, madam. That I'm a well-meaning youngster. And to be honest with you, many a friendly old lady writes to me day in and day out and begins a letter just exactly that. And with that, enconium, or is an enconium, mum, mum, cronium, mum, cronium, mum, mum. Dear Mr. Shepherd, I know by the sound of your voice that you're a nice, young, Christian American. I cannot understand why you do the things you do. Oh, I'm the sheep, oh, baby, I'm a sheep, a bear, a bee. Oh, your love belongs to me. At night, when you're asleep, blow that thing, man. And to your tandy rent, I'll creep, 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 creep the stars that shine above. We'll light our way to love. Oh, oh, oh. You'll rule this land with me. I'm the sheik, 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 the sheik, sheik, sheik of Arabi. <laughs> I, I really, you know, I, I don't know just quite how to do it. Uh, I'll never forget, madam, the time that, that my mother, the very funny thing happened. Uh, the only the only remark my mother, Carl, has ever made about my program. I, are any of you curious what my mother has said about my show? It's a very strange remark. She's only heard it on, on rare occasions, you know. She gets to New York once in a while, and she listened to it. And, and I, 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 went, I rushed up to the place where she was staying. She was staying in this hotel. So, you know, I rushed up, and I says, hey, Ma, how'd you like my show? And there's a short pause. She says to me, you, you always were a very funny kid. You always were a very funny kid. And she had the same sound in her voice as those ladies who write to me from Staten Island, who begin by saying, I enjoy your program, but if you'd stop making those funny noises. <laughs> forget it, baby. Forget it. Ollie, forget it. You know, speaking of forgetting it, uh, were you agog today over Coop? Or do you think that only the press was agog today over Coop? Now, I just wonder where it starts. You know, I'm sitting on a bus, and it's at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And, and, you know, there's about 19 people in the bus, and I'm, I'm sitting up there in the front looking back, Ed. And there's, a, you know how people look, there's like jaws hanging slackly, eyeballs glazed, uh, a couple of guys with their feet out in the aisle, somebody chewing... <laughs> I could hear this chick chewing gum all the way from the back seat there. You know, the 19-year-old pimple type, chewing the gum. And they're just glazedly looking. And I'm, I'm looking out on, the, out on the street there, and the, and the people are walking past, you know, with the same glazed look on there. I'm just walking along, and the sun is coming down. And there's a guy about the third seat from the left there. He's holding up a copy of it. looked like the Daily News. I don't know which one. The very excitable newspaper. You know, it says, Coop! Coop! Oh, 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 the news. The headline says, Coop! Coop! City wild! City insane going wild! City is absolutely wild! Over Coop! Coop! I've got a little bit of a 
once again, the BBC continues its long-standing program entitled England for Englishmen. We'll fight them from their throws. We'll fight them with the dishes or the pigeon. We'll fight them with lead, blood, sweat, and tears. I can't serve always be in England. The BBC's third program brings you tonight's feature story of particular interest to all Englishmen. Hornchurch, England, May 20th. The Hornchurch drum and bugle car went for a weekend rehearsal in Peter Reed's pasture. Mr. Reed's 50 cows lifted their heads with interest as the bandsmen unpacked their instruments and Ben Master Brian Keeler raised his baton for John Philip Sousa's Semper Fidelis. The drums blared out. The horns blow to the skies, and the drums boomed. Five cows dropped dead. The rest stampeded. My God, these are not English cows. Standing athwart the ramparts. With fortitude, with courage. With steadfast determination. No face it out. And so tonight we salute these English cows who died. A brave Englishman is a brave Englishman, howsoever and whomsoever he died to the sound of martial music. Mr. Keeler, the bandmaster, apologized profusely, and we quote him. Brass bands may not be everybody's cup of tea, he said, but I have never heard of anyone dying after hearing us play. They were obviously terrified by the noise. But he added, These things happen. He raised his baton and went on bravely. Onward, men! Onward! Let us take it back at the coda. Let us play the second repeat all the way. Mr. Keeler finally concluded his short remarks with this statement. Everywhere we go, someone objects. And so tonight, the BBC salutes not only Mr. Keeler, we also salute Peter Reed's English cows who died in the performance of their duty as English women standing ready ready to be milked, ready to give their all for that which is England. I got there will always be in England. Listen tomorrow night at the same time on the BBC's third program for our special salute to England. Stay tuned for our special broadcast, The Gentleman on the Avenue, a special interview broadcast of The Man on the Sidewalk, which follows immediately after Big Ben crashes out the hour and carries the sound of England to all four corners of the globe. Good night. <laughs> you feel a little better. It's like a catharsis. You know, speaking of, uh, what is the uh, plural of catharsis? Is it catharsi? 
Ask uh, Ted, our expert on words. Is it catharsi? <laughs> catharsi sounds like a battle in the War of the Roses. Catharsi or the Thirty Years' War. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Or an English essayist. No, more like a French essayist. Let's say Montaigne de Catharsi. Catharsi? Uh, speaking of uh, battles of one kind or another, this is W.O.R., and uh, we'll be here until the Long John. Oh, speaking of the Long John show, if you care to stay up tonight and get bugged even more than usual, I'll be on the Long John show all night. And as a tip, the Long... Oh, now stop it, Ed. Now, that was a very unkind thing to say. Just because you're from New Jersey and the square's a bear is not my... It's really, it's not my real... All right, go on, go on, hit that. It was a very rotten thing to say. You just said a terrible thing in there, Ed. Great. <laughs> Always be an engineer. <laughs> All right, cut it there, cut it there. Our special salute. Uh, let's see, we have with us also Mandarin House. Hey, listen, Daddy, if you go to Mandarin House shortly, and uh, I'm going to recommend uh, the one up on 2nd Avenue in this instance, just north of 57th Street, uh, please ask for twice cooked pork. Oh, it is fantastic. Unbelievable. Uh, uh, Croggy Bob Blubber. Oopsie <laughs> Pipsy. It's good. It's uh, twice cooked pork. And what they do to it the second time, I could not describe because there are children listening. But what it does, it. it oh, boy. I, I suspect that within five years it'll be illegal. So you better get up there while it's still swinging. This is the Mandarin House on 2nd Avenue, just north. This is Mandarin East, just north of 57th Street. And they have a bar, and they're open on Sunday, and it's great. And ask for Emily when you go in there. Be careful. They have the most insanely sensational waitresses I've ever seen in my life. I've often wanted to ask them. Okay, now let's get back to business here, all right? Uh, speaking of getting back to business, uh, I, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 wonder, I wonder really about some of these things that have to do with uh, great mass... Uh, things that happen in, in our time. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, how many of you felt agog today? How many of you felt like you were going wild today? You did. I did you. I yes, yeah, you do have the wild look, Ed. That's true. I can tell. There are some guys. I'm sure it's the way they wear their glasses or something, or the sun hits their ears or something. But uh, uh, every all day long, I kept hearing newscasters saying that New York was wild. And everywhere I went, everyone looked the same as they always did, you know, like half asleep. <laughs> I suspect that it's only the newspapers that go wild over these big things. And I also not, not that now this is not an anti uh, anti astronaut remark I'm making here. It's just that I wonder whether or not some of the adjectives that we apply to great public displays are ever really accurate. Now I suppose if you're in the ballroom of the Waldorf, you are wild. But if you're living, say, in the Babylon, Long Island, and you're having trouble with the washer, are you wild about Cooper, that is, at that time? Now, if, you, if you're having a fist fight on 49th Street with a cab driver, is it Cooper you're wild about? I don't know. I doubt it very much. I, I was in a I was in a Needix not more than five minutes after you know I could hear the guy on the radio. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, once again we're on a great public display. New York is going all out this time. New York is going out this time. Ten million people are agog. Astronaut J. Cooper has just lighted, and now he's waving at the crowd. All of New York is going wild. Well, I had I had this radio. You see, and I'm hearing this, and and uh, I, just as I hear that, I go into this Needix. And there's a bunch of guys sitting around there chewing on the back end of a hamburger. And all the while, I'm, I'm trying to find the New York that's going wild. And, you know, it's just scratching. It's just going along there scratching. <laughs> now, the question I'd like, to, I'd like to bring out is, is this, really. That a thousand years from now, when somebody picks up a newspaper and it says, all of New York goes wild. Well... I wonder whether or not they'll have any idea about all those guys sitting around the edicts, not even knowing what's going on, or caring, for that matter. I say probably 95% of the people in any given gigantic, well-advertised, publicized, enormous display of any kind don't care, nor do they even know what it's about. It's the truth. 
Uh, I just, just, just suspect, because most of this stuff is very unreal to most, you know, to people anyway. It's just it's a big thing that's happening somewhere. It's like, it's about as real as a Debbie Reynolds picture. And, and uh, it's true, you know. And, and to most people, Cooper is not an engineer, which he is, you know, an engineer and a test pilot. He's a star. And I'm sure that, that, that there's more than one resort up in the Catskills that would love to get him for a weekend. You know, just with the Eddie Eddie Fisher and you know, you know all the other stars. We make stars, you know, like we really seriously. We make we make stars like uh, well, like some places make uh, popcorn, you know. And 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 a star is a star is a star. To, to quote uh, uh, Miss Stein, and I'm I'm quite convinced that most people are not are not even aware of what a star, you know, what, what the star does. He's a star. That's a he's a star. And, and have you noticed that a star today is interchangeable? He can do anything. If if you're playing, say Ben Casey is is a doctor in the in the TV series, he also does a tap dance at Las Vegas, and probably if he wanted to, could become a senator, because stars are interchangeable. Oh yes, yeah, stars are very interchangeable in the showbiz world. We do not elect thinkers or idea people or anything anymore. We elect stars. We do. Uh, they're stars. Uh, Barry Goldwater is a star to people. Uh, Rockefeller is a star. He's a star. Uh, oh, yes, it's, it's very different. And, and, of course, there's different kinds of stars. There's stars you don't like. And I suspect that if, if, uh, if you don't like Rockefeller, it's just on the same order of, say, if, if, for example, you don't like Zachary Scott. You know, it's the cut of the eyebrow. It's the way the jaw is. Uh, it's the kind of hair. It's a lot of things, you know. Uh, because, because our world, you see, <laughs> our, world, our world is getting to be more and more... Of a, of a thing where you can't really reach out and touch anything actually, really. It's all coming to you vicariously on a gigantic tape from someplace where it's really happening, uh, where, where, there's, where, where something is apparently going on. Eddie, do you have on my upward and onward with the machine music? Do you have it there? All right, get it away. One, two, three, upward. <laughs> Now, Electronic Brain analyzes your security. Compucast. Pan American Life's electronic computer gives you an analytic study of your future financial security, uncolored by human opinion, persuasion, or prejudice. Where do you stand? Most of us have a fair idea of where we stand today. How much security do you really have? Ask Pan American Life's new IBM electronic data processing equipment. This is the modern method of taking stock of your personal requirements for future peace of mind. With no human influence. You merely fill out a confidential information card with the answers to a brief, simple set of questions. The infallible electronic brain uses this information to calculate your financial and security picture scientifically. Yes. The IBM electronic data processing equipment gives you an analytical study of your security position uncolored by human opinion, persuasion, or prejudice. (laughs) Mankind marches on. Better living through the cathode follower circuit. Now, if you think that's good, 
I like the idea. Uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting to note a great universal suspicion of all other people is beginning to creep into everything we do. Are you aware of that? That really is saying something about what we think about other people. I quote that again. Do you, do you, do you got something up there for quoting, Eddie? That's it. Uncolored by human opinion, persuasion, or prejudice. Hello. Win. Hello. Hello, people. Car. People. Hello. <laughs> Don't you trust me anymore? Am I a purveyor of human opinion? And you know how that can be? Persuasion? Or prejudice? Hello, people. Is, is, is there anybody out there that has just a little trust in me? As infallible as I am, I got a bad knee. Everywhere, suspicion is beginning to slowly ebb to the surface. And yet, you know, on the other hand, we are continually saying, no matter what religion you belong to, there is the reiterated theme that America and the rest of the Western world is becoming more religious every day. And one of the basic tenets of religion, it seems to me, in most of the Western religions, is a faith, a peculiar kind of all-inclusive love of your fellow man. I repeat, uncolored by human opinion, persuasion, or, and loaded word, prejudice. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. Speaking of that, uh, Ed, do you have... You have something that is big and, and, and romantic in there. Just hold it there. That's, that's good enough for it. Uh, going through the New Year. Oh, you see little things everywhere you look, you know, little, little tiny itsy bitsy things. There was a, there was a, uh, no, I suspect my trombone players back there, Eddie, would be just right for this. My trombone players. Yeah, okay, sneak it in there. Nothing good, nothing better than a good sad trombone player with a sticky spit valve. Hey, that isn't my trombone player. Oh, what do you got for crying out loud? <laughs> That's Gordon Cooper going by again. Hold it there. <laughs> speaking of, of uh, speaking of uh, that Gordon Cooper thing, I don't know whether you listened to any of those speeches today. Talk about sick making. You know. Once again, we believe that it proves that the human endeavor, reaching ever upward and onward, marching forward in the great, great, ever and eternal search for the knowledge of all the questions which lie just beyond the edge of human experience. Yes, once again, we feel that as mankind reaches for the stars, we feel that all of us and all of us together, each and every one of us, being good, brave, clean, solid, beautiful limbed Americans. Yes, the American way of life. Razzmatazz, Rudy, too. Give me another hamburger, Joe. And forward and ever upward and onward as we are reaching ever forward. Thank the millions of little people, all with their hopes and prayers, resting upon the great ever-avenging angels as we have passed the muster on the other hand. Yes, sir, that's my baby, amen. And so as we pass once again and two, and I would like to say as one more small man, in Bob in conclusion, in Hawker Ricular Pongkin, as he pluralist you know, as we say, we once again salute and onward as we say, salute Hawker, he pluralist you know, and other hand, please, Bob Jackson, I'm a boss, Very exciting. Very exciting. Very exciting. You know, uh, going through the New Yorker today, you, there's little signs everywhere of uh, this thing. You know, this thing that we're that whatever it is, this this growing strange kind of distrust 
this strange, peculiar kind of distrust. There was an ad, see, and it shows a man. It shows a man walking into a doorway, and he's wearing a jazzy sport coat, and he is being greeted by another man also wearing a jazzy sport coat. And the second man is considerably older than the first man. And it says in bold letters, You know when you've arrived, when the boss invites you to his home and says it is not on business. And then down below it says, Ask about our new look. The new look this year is... The Courageous Look. <laughs> Hello, Test. One, two, three, four. Am I getting through? Hello? Hello, Test. Hello, Staten Island. Hello? 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 Hello, Queens. Hello, Test. Hello? Hello? Hello, Augusta, Maine. Am I getting through? Yes, are you going to be seen in the smart watering places this year in the... What are you afraid of, Dad? <laughs> 87,000 guys immediately themselves say chicks. <laughs> 84 million women say men. Oh, what do you mean no? Stop it. Stop it. What do you think drives ladies into the stacks? The stacks, the eternal world of dusty research into worlds long gone and past. And a lot of things. What do you think drives men into it? I'd like to know just <laughs> how many. <laughs> Seriously, I'll tell you. It's funny. <whistles> you know, I'd, 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 another question I'd like to ask, too. I wonder how many people know that your entire outlook on, on life is colored by your physical condition. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm telling you that it is very true that a man who has high blood pressure looks at the world in a very different way from a man who has low blood pressure. It's just the natural result of high blood pressure operating on your brain. You know, the old blood... The blood pounding through that old brain, you know, makes it a little different than the guy whose blood is just going... Very different. I, I would like to, uh, I w really, I would like to raise the question, uh, uh, question raised in this case uh, sincerely. I would like to raise the question and say how much of a writer's talent is due to his blood pressure or lack of it? That many a guy views the world coolly because <laughs> his blood pressure is low. And many a man uh, views the world with a purple passion and almost on the, on the edge of uh, hysteria. Do you, are you aware of what a continual small-level fever will do to you? Seriously. Uh, one of the few people I've, I've ever heard of who ever really wrote a, much about this, and he, he did it in a fictional way, but yet a philosophical way, was Thomas Mann, the late great uh, German writer. And Mann... Mann touched on this many times in a book called The Magic Mountain, where he was dealing with the lives of uh, tuberculars, people living on a high mountaintop uh, where they were being treated for tuberculosis. And because they continually had a, a low-grade fever, life was viewed in a very different way from those who did not have a low-grade fever. You know what happens when you get a cold? And, and and you just have a couple of degrees, you know, of fever, and you're just sort of drifting along there, and everything has a vague unreality to it. Uh, there's a peculiar sensation of floating. Well, now, if you were to write a novel about life under that condition, you would have a very different attitude towards everything you saw or felt. You really would. Uh, 
And, and the other day I finished reading a novel, and it was a very peculiar thing. See, I'm reading it halfway through and through on and on and on, and I get to about the three-quarter mark, and it, it kept ringing familiar notes in my mind, not for uh, actual technique or subject matter, but viewpoint and kind of aura. I can only say kind of aura. See, so I'm about a three-quarter way through, and suddenly it hit me. It was as though this man was writing out of a delirium of a low-grade fever. Not a delirium, really. It's not true delirium. It's border-edge delirium. It's right on the edge of it, you know. And as you go higher and higher in the scale of, of a temperature, you, you, you will slip generally into more and more of a delirium state. This is, this is part of a, of a fever, you know. You've, you've probably had a, a short periods of delirium at one time or another in your life when you've had a fever. Well, I, I would like to know what would happen if, and it probably has happened many times, a writer with an infection of the lung, you see, which he does not know about, writes through this kind of thing, and the critics never recognize, we never really recognize the function of the body on the psyche of the individual. We really don't. We really do. Uh, a man who, let's say, is born with a bad leg, or somehow early in life is crippled, his body will invariably color his whole outlook towards everything he sees around him, whether he likes it or not. And I just wonder how many guys are, are, are suddenly, without their knowledge, are cured of something. Let's say a man has a one or two degree fever and a, and a slight case of high blood pressure. And he's writing like a fiend. You know, he's going away there, and he's got this wild edge to his writing and this insane view, and he's got this beautiful insights. And then one day, you know, gradually, like you do, uh, a year and a half, he's going along like that, and his, his infection heals. And everything sort of goes back into focus, like when you're getting over a cold, you know. And he's trying to write yet. He's still trying to write this stuff, and it just doesn't come out. And, and the, the critics say, well, I don't know what happened to, to, to Forrest Berg's wonderful talent. That beautiful, illusionary world that he had created, suddenly it seems to have lost its edge. It seems to be labored. And he's trying to pound it out, and it doesn't come anymore. <laughs> one of the reasons, I, I suspect this is one of the reasons why, why many a writer will find himself hitting the jug, looking for the same illusion that he once had because he had high blood pressure. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating problem. Very few writers... Uh, I know of, have ever, have ever, pro you know, speaking of, of, uh, of the illusion and the hallucinations which uh, many of us have from moment to moment and from time to time, I, I have another thing here which, uh, again, as I say, you, you, you walk around and you, you begin to have, a, 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 sometimes you have a vague sense that, that everything is completely, completely laughable. And you also, other times you have a sense of, ah, you know, meh. And then sometimes it's nothing, and they just walk around, and it says just buildings there, and people are coming out and going out and drinking water and hollering and standing in line and getting in the subway. Well, you, you don't know why at one moment you can see it and in another moment you can't. This has always been uh, a problem the psychologists have, have dealt with. Why can one person, for example, two people of, of say, uh, equivalent education and equivalent, uh, let's say, measurable IQ, who knows what this is, uh, and even uh, roughly comparable backgrounds. Why, taking taking two people, why will one look at life and see all sorts of things happening, the inner things happening, and the the uh, the symbolic meanings of things, and the other guy just thinks, yeah, it's Wednesday. <laughs> you know, it's just Wednesday. What they're, what they're not talking about? It's Wednesday. Give me a hot dog. And and uh, that's all he wants to know. It's Wednesday. It's it's uh, four o'clock. You ask him, well, what what is life about, Charlie? Did you notice that strange little development yesterday afternoon when they said in the New Yorker that the newest style is the courageous look? What do you think of that? Oh, that's them. Yeah, I saw there's a button-down collar. I know it. That's with the, with the plaids. Well, but don't you say it's, it's a little odd, you know, the courageous look, Charlie? Well, what do you mean courageous look? It just means a button-down collar with the plaids. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a plaid, you know. It's a, that means a, a very bright plaid, very bright. But, Charlie, courageous, courageous. What do you mean courageous about what, Charlie? Courageous. What do you mean courageous about what? What are you, what are you scared of? Scared me? Ah, you're out of your mind. <laughs> and all the while, if you look carefully in those bright blue eyes, you see a strange watery light, the watery light of fear. Something is coming around the edge of the building at 47th Street. He doesn't quite know what it is, but it's coming out of that green glass. 
whatever it is he doesn't know. And so, of course, of course no one quite knows what it is, and, and no one knows what the fear is. Just that general free-flowing fear. Now, now, uh, in our age, we have a we have a remarkable age, and I think it's remarkable for one thing: we all suspect that we can pinpoint where the fear comes from. Those rotten other guys. In general, whatever the rotten other guys are. Now, if you're hip, it's the guys living out in uh, Darien. Uh, if you're uh, if you're a, 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 a completely dedicated, uh, let's say, uh, social uh, uh, forward progress type, you feel it's from all those rotten people who are for whatever it is that you're for. They're for against it. No, it's, you know, it's, it's the other side. If you're a Republican, it's the Democrats. It really is. It's, it's as simple as that. In fact, the other day there was a, there was a poll taken... And the poll was, and the question was, which is one of those great, wild, nonsensical questions, quote, do you feel that America is moving ahead? Right, you mean moving ahead. What, 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 what is this? See, these, I, I love these wild, non-meaning, moving ahead into what? What are we moving? You know, when you're moving, you're progressing from A to G or to D or L or P or Q or someplace. What do you mean moving ahead? It's one of the great uh, one of the one of the great concepts of our of our time. I'm talking about in all nations this this concept of moving. Nobody quite knows what moving ahead is, and they all they all analyze it in terms of their own particular bit. You know, moving ahead. Moving ahead means I'm making more dough. That's what one guy thinks. Another guy will will uh, do it in in terms of uh, human rights. Oh, well, uh, guys are running on the streetcars. Didn't run on streetcars before. Well. Uh, uh, interesting question. What is meant by moving ahead? Well, here's what they found. They found that when they asked people, they were almost completely split exactly according to whatever party they belonged to. Yes, sir. And so that means that if, if, if the Democrats are in and you're a Republican, what do you mean moving ahead? This country has been in trouble since Kennedy got in. For crying out loud. Well, now if you're if you're a Democrat and Eisenhower is in, and you say, "Are we moving? I'm moving ahead." That guy's out of the plane. Golf all day long, moving ahead. We've been sitting on our thing here for the last eight years. Nothing. What do you mean, big old balloon with generals? Well, the point. <laughs> the, 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 what we're getting to is that it's all nonsense. All nonsense. Uh, such questions as moving ahead, uh, progress. Uh, one of the few people I've ever read who ever touched on this subject is Aldous Huxley. Now, of course, I, I know that a lot of people are saying, what is this not talking about? Well, let, let's put it on this basis. Uh, we have now made gigantic moves towards space. We assume that all of mankind is moving ahead. That has done absolutely nothing to your life. Nothing. I can assure you, nothing to your life. In fact, to whose life has it done anything? Cooper. <laughs> all right. You know, all right. Okay. Now, now that's, that's, a, that's a good question, you know, really. So, so uh, uh, don't, don't put it aside so quickly, so, so rapidly. You know, it's, I, I, uh, I, I have a feeling that, that mankind generally is like a gigantic school of fish just moving in an enormous bay. Or even pond. Let's put it on that basis. Pond. And and as we move around the shoreline of this pond, we feel that since we are now at Charlie's Dock, we have progressed. Because last week we were at Al's Pier. Well, man has a very short memory, and so does a school of fish. And he continues to move in this enormous clockwise fashion along the shore of the lake. Spring, summer, winter, fall. Well, the thing about it is that is that some fish halfway around the lake die. Now they they had a vague remembrance of once having been at Al's Pier. Other fish have been born since we were at Al's Pier. And as we arrive once again at Al's Pier, they applaud loudly. Oh, now we finally understand where to. And a few very ancient fish say, "You know, this looks familiar." I, I'm not so sure it is so new. Ah, you mean this is the new brave world? This is the way it is. Shut up, you old fish! Get in the back there. This is this is the first time we've ever seen Al Spear. 
Well, one of the old fish says, well, it looks kind of familiar. Of course, what has happened is a whole year has, has, has intervened, and so a couple of the pilings have fallen down, and they put up a new piling. So he isn't quite sure. And we move on. And the great eternal movement continues on and 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 on. I'm sure when the finishing touches were laid on the Sphinx, 87 million Egyptians said, and in a speech it was stated, once again I would like to address all Egyptians who are looking up at one of the great achievements of all time, man reaching for the stars has at last succeeded. And that great stone face stared out, and every little Egyptian felt that progress had been made. We have moved forward one more tiny millimeter, and somehow his life had inched forward along with it. Now, if you were to ask an individual way back in the last row there with his, with his headpiece on and holding a spear, well, now, how has the Sphinx changed your life? It's progress. It's progress, you idiot. Progress. Well, I don't know. What is progress? Are you still having trouble with your knee? I don't know. <laughs> Are we moving along? Has the country progressed? Huh? I don't know. You know, they didn't know about this. Are you aware that the word progress is a recent invention, like the computer? Are you aware of that? Oh, yes. In the sense that we use it, it is a completely new invention and will probably be one of the things that the 20th century will be known for. Like the invention of the wheel, the invention of the word progress. It's a new concept. If you had stopped a 19th century man on the street, let's say in 1830, and said to him, how's progress going in Belgium? He would look at you with a funny look. Do you know that in many areas of the world today, the word progress has no meaning whatsoever? No meaning at all. Are you also aware that in some areas of the world they never heard of the word love or have even an equivalent for it? That, too, is another one of the inventions of our time.